Hello, friends. Welcome once again to uh, the conversation here on FC TV. We are delighted that you have chosen to join my co-host, Angela Scott Price and me for another interesting discussion around issues of race and racism. And this show is uh, very timely in that we are going to be talking about disparities, racial disparities in the delivery of medicine, healthcare to black and brown people. It's particularly timely because we are now seeing the beginning of dissemination of the vaccines for the COVID-19 infection. And there are all kinds of questions about how black and brown people will, if they will participate, in the vaccine, uh, receiving the vaccine or not, as well as some other issues. So we asked a couple of people on the street, uh, but they actually were at home, but we asked them a couple of questions. And one of them is, where do you see, where do you see racial disparities in healthcare in regards to black and brown people? So. Let's see what they had to say. Right. So I think there's two parts to that question that I was thinking about. One is uh, sort of uh, geographically, and the other one is what I would term, and I'm not the creator of this term by any means, but the, the sort of what the patient journey is. Uh, so um, I think the geographically, it's really, everywhere. I mean, racial disparities uh, take place, whether it's in rural areas of the country or in urban areas. Uh, and it's really a result of the, I guess, the, the, the stratification of um, access to, um, to real estate, really, you know, um, since the Jim Crow laws and, and on beyond that, redlining locally, you know, in, in Boston. So you are able to have segregation uh, that persists long after the actual laws that created that in the first place. And certainly on the Cape, it's even magnified, I would say, because if you don't have good access to transportation and you're, you know, you're trying to get to um, the local hospital, whether it's, in, you know, whether it's in Hyannis or in Falmouth, you know, hopping on the bus for that is, uh, you know, means you're taking an enormous amount of time out of your day. And uh, if you're already struggling with, um, either health issues or financial issues, then that is just a huge challenge. So we see it um, really prevalently right now during this pandemic where um, African-American people are dying at um, a rate of, of three times, you know, more than um, other races. Um, we also, we see it and not particularly any fault of our own um, being African-American people, but, um, due to um, circumstances like um, access to affordable health care, access, um, you know, housing situations, um, you know, the workplace. Uh. So if you want to even pursue something because you think it's important, having that access becomes very uh, difficult. Um, and then just in general within the healthcare. care um, organization, I guess, uh, you know, there are, there have been studies showing that, for instance, uh, pain management is deprioritized for, um, for uh, black uh, patients, uh, compared with white patients, that if you're feeling pain as a white person, then more likely you get uh, tools to help you manage it, whether it's drugs or anything else. Whereas if you are not white, then um, those tools are not uh, made available for whatever reason. Um, I think there's also a trust issue um, within our community that uh, questions um, the level of health care that we're given as well. Welcome back to the conversation. As you just heard from the individuals offering their opinions, we are addressing the issue of racial disparities in medicine, healthcare delivery. And we have a very 
distinguished uh, group of folks to join us for uh, the conversation. And I want to do a brief introduction of them, but we will hear a little bit more from them as we move through the program. Uh, first, Joe Burns is a freelance journalist uh, who writes about health and healthcare and health insurance. He has written for a number of uh, publications, including the New York Times, Medical Economics Magazine, Managed Healthcare Executive, and um, he has covered the issue of healthcare since uh, 1991. And so he obviously has seen and heard and thought a lot about this question. Also with us tonight is um, David Puffert, a PhD affiliated with Penn State College of Medicine, uh, living in Pennsylvania now. He is a professor emeritus and now retired but uh, still uh, has individuals under his tutelage. And his specialty has been in family medicine and psychiatry. And uh, he served as professor of behavioral sciences and chair of medical humanities. So again, we're delighted to have him with us. And local resident, Gwyneth Packard, uh, is part of our panel tonight. Gwyneth moved to this area in 1991. She came for what she thought was going to be a 12-week internship, and she's still here. And Falmouth is, um, is blessed, if I might say, by her presence. She's very active in the community, co-chairing the Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. She's an organizer for the Mariah Mitchell Women of Science Symposium, and also is involved with Engage Falmouth. So welcome to uh, Joe, uh, David, and Gwyneth. So we're gonna jump right into the conversation and uh, ask you, we'll start with you, Joe, sort of going alphabetically, to um, give us your thoughts, your answer to the question, where do you see disparities, racial disparities in the delivery of med medicine and healthcare to black and brown people? Um, that's a great question, Will, thank you so much. Uh, I see it everywhere. Um, I actually started working on this um, uh, idea of racial disparities, not that it's my idea, but I started writing about it and doing some research for it in the last um, eight weeks or so. Actually, um, uh, Angie invited me to, uh, and her friends at uh, Racial Justice Falmouth, Racial Justice Falmouth, um, to make a presentation. When was that, Angie? In September, October? October, yes. Yeah. October. Yeah. Um, and um, so I started to, to, started to look into it, and I was surprised at how much information is available. In fact, I was just looking for a story that was in the New York Times yesterday about COVID and racial disparities. And uh, they made the point that it's not so much a, um, uh, a genetic factor, it's really um, uh, social injustice. And uh, so I, I, I can't find it now. Someone sent it to me and I can't remember if they sent it to me by text or by email, but um, it's a huge uh, problem. At, we've seen uh, COVID infection rates rising among uh, black and brown, Native American, Asian American people. Uh, and those rates are higher, the death rate is higher uh, than they are for white people. And uh, I think, um, I don't wanna say COVID has a silver lining because it, it doesn't, but um, if it does, it has pointed out that uh, racial inequality is uh, rampant in the United States. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the coronavirus is spreading so quickly and deaths are rising so rapidly among those populations. I, th I thank you for that, Joe. If if someone had asked me, I think I could have told them that there were racial uh, racial disparities, but nobody asked. Right? <laughs> Why don't we uh, go to uh, Professor Hufford and uh, ask you to give us your initial answer and, and thoughts to the question of morale, racial disparities? Do much better than starting the way Joe did. We find them everywhere, uh, and I taught about this at the medical school for over 30 years. And I must say, it's important to be aware there is pushback. These are not things that the profession really likes to hear. 
and most members of the profession, I think, exempt themselves while being able to think of others they think might have some, some problem with this. Um, but it's, it's really crucial to say that the source of these problems is, and this came up in what Joe said also, is almost entirely social and behavioral. It is not genetic. Uh, and I would give you uh, one, mo not all studies look at this, but they always should. A few years ago, not many, uh, a study looking at the difference between maternal and white uh, mother and infant mortality uh, at pregnancy and birth found that the black mortality among mothers and infants was 243% of the rate among white women. Now, they looked at all sorts of different kinds of aspects, trying to come up with an explanation for this. And uh, eventually, they began to think, well, maybe this is genetic. So, and, and one reason for that is that uh, some people listening may be aware that some very well-known wealthy black women have had very difficult pregnancies and birth situations. Serena Williams was one. Her story is really illustrative. Beyonce is another. And they thought, well, it's obviously not poverty, so it must be something more fundamentally biological. And they did a brilliant study comparing infant and maternal mortality among African women in Africa, who then migrated to the United States. And they followed them, they had a large sample, so they had plenty of pregnancies and births. And the women in Africa had, had mortality and morbidity similar to the white population in America. When those women moved to the United States over a period of five or six years, the incidence of mortality and morbidity in that sample rose to roughly the same as the black American population. It is something about being in America. Uh, not to say that, I mean, they were not comparing this to Europe or any other part of the world. Uh, and it's not to say that there are no, um, what we might call behavioral disparities in Africa, but it really does show that whatever is producing this is not genetic, certainly not primarily genetic. And I think part of the background to our conversation would be, I would hope, and I know that not everyone is comfortable with this, that there is very little genetic difference between what we call the races. And race is purely a social construct in the modern world. Uh, we share 99.99% of the DNA of the human race among all of us. There's very little genetic difference. So anyway, it's everywhere. And the sources are behavioral and social, including economic, educational. Um, what are some other illustrations that we should? So poverty, education, employment, transportation, location, redlining, neighborhoods, those things are all sources of health differences. And they are not individual. They all affect each other. And so it's a very complicated issue. But anyhow, back to what I said at the beginning, Joe's right. It's everywhere. And I do have to say, we really need to be thoughtful about the pushback that we get on this, having been through many experiences with the dean being very unhappy with me finding out that I was teaching our students that there were such disparities in healthcare today, but I couldn't not teach it. Oh, good for you. You've raised several uh, important questions and uh, areas of this topic that I would like for us to explore. I'm sure Angie's gonna wanna delve deeper into it, but let me bring in Gwyneth uh, to the discussion, Gwyneth Packard, a Falmouth uh, resident. Uh, so this is something I know you've um, thought about yourself, uh, studied um, yourself. So give us your initial response to the question, Absolutely. why yeah. these exist? 
Thank you. Um, I'm coming at this from the perspective of a, a black, white, biracial woman. My, my mother was black. Um, my father is white. Um, and we see racial disparities in the, obviously, in the occurrences and outcomes of COVID now, which has put the spotlight on this um, with black, indigenous, and Hispanic people all many more times likely um, than white people to die from this virus. But as Dad pointed out, we've had decades of studies showing racial disparities in everything from environmental exposure, maternal and infant um, health, uh, onset of disease, treatment of chronic illness, pain management, and the effects of incarceration on the health of family members, let alone on inmates. The, and um, when you look closer, you're seeing that the differences are in every stage from the delivery of preventative care to entry paths to care plans, to wait times for treatment and the delivery of care plans over time. So there's, there's a lot to look at. And, and I, I do like thinking about it as a system. It, um, there, there is resistance to the individual taking on responsibility. Um, but if we look at it as systems and subsystems and talk about affecting you know, if you can affect the education or incarceration um, system to affect impact the health subsystem, um, it can be helpful to, to let people examine it that way. Thank you, Gwyneth. Um, so, Angie, what um, what are your thoughts on this this subject? What questions do you have for our panelists? So, I don't know if I thought much about racial disparities in healthcare because I'm relatively young and relatively healthy and hadn't really seen the doctor too much. But um, from personal experience is when I, I thought about this really a few years ago, um, basically long story short, I, I had acne for like the longest time. And I, I saw my OBGYN every year, I saw my regular doctor and they were just like, drink more water. Don't eat junk food, you know, all this, all the stupid things that they tell you. And it wasn't until I saw a black OBGYN that he said, You're a bit, you're a bit old to have acne. I bet you have PCOS. And polycystic ovarian syndrome is so common. I think it's one in two or one in three women have it. And yet, in like the 25 or I guess 13, 14 years I had been seeing an OBGYN, it had never come up, was never even discussed or talked about. And so I started to wonder, well, why is it that it wasn't until I saw a black OBGYN after seeing six or seven different ones while I was in college and moving around that it was finally brought to my attention, was checked for it. Sure enough, I have it, gave me a pill, no more acne. Like, and there's other things that come along with PCOS, but it was, it was very frustrating to know that something so common was not even discussed with me. And so then I started wondering about that in other aspects of life. Um, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so when she started going through um, her, she didn't have to do chemo, but she had to do radiation. I started wondering, well, are they actually giving her the best care as a black woman? Like, are they actually telling her everything she needs to know? So then I started asking those questions. And something that David brought up was about um, Serena Williams and Beyonce going through their pregnancies and really hit home of like, wait, if these women, incredibly well known, all the money in the world, and they aren't even getting the best care, I really need to advocate for myself. And I really have to pay attention and ask questions. And that's one of the things that kind of terrifies me about potentially having kids. But I feel like that's a whole nother subject. So we'll, we'll leave that alone for now. So that's my thoughts. Well, Marie uh, Younger Blackburn in her um, uh, comments uh, from, from the street, so to speak, uh, talked about that, that, you know, we have to advocate for ourselves. We being a, a people of color, we really have to advocate for ourselves. And that one of the articles I was reading in preparation for our time together talked about how there is a, a marked difference um, in the uh, health of a black person that may have been seen for years by a white physician uh, who then decides that, you know, I just don't think that physician is listening to me. I don't, I don't think she or he's hearing me. And so I'm going to try this black physician. And sure enough, they go to a black physician and voila, like your experience, Angie, all of a sudden 
they are listened to, other uh, questions are raised, different type of discussion uh, takes place. So let me, let me ask our panelists and whoever would like to jump in on it, um, feel free to do so. Just not all at once, okay? Um, so why? I mean, you, you know, uh, David sort of, he started giving us sort of a litany of things and poverty and uh, geography and, and what have you. But let me give each of you, each of you a chance for you to say. Uh, I'd, I'd like to I, jump in, Bill, yeah. if I may. Uh, and I would, this is a place to bring up another interesting comparison, and that is the treatment of women compared to the treatment of African Americans. There are similar problems, problems of credibility, problems of dismissal, and so forth. And part of the solution for the individual, particularly, is that a number of studies have shown that African-American physicians and female physicians are more willing to listen, more open to the story that they're hearing and more sympathetic. Uh, and in fact, it, a lot of people thought that that was on the gender side, that that was a, just an important thing for women to discover, but some studies have shown men find the same thing. Uh, it's, you get more listening and more thought out of a female physician than you do a male physician. Now this is all, I don't mean to be that to be a stereotype, but in general, there is that. And I think that that is one of the things, and, and Anji found it, uh, that could help when you, if you are, I was gonna say, if you're not sure that you're really being listened to. However, cautionary note there, you do not always know when you're not being listened to. Right. So the sympathetic ear, the, the thoughtful person, and you said, you asked why. I suspect it's because women and African Americans have been dismissed and not listened to so much in our society that they are just more aware uh, and more interested in doing something about it. Hmm. Anyway, that's part of it. There was an interesting study that I read um, about the they wanted to see if there was a um, difference for having um, same race doctor for a population of black men. They had to put together a diverse clinic because they couldn't find one. So they hired half white and half black doctors, men, all men, um, to, and they told the doctors that their primary mission at this clinic was to convince people to take on preventative care measures, there were five of them, they increased in, in um, severity of invasiveness and expense. So like the, the, the least impactful one was take their blood pressure and then it went up to um, having a shot or um, getting your blood drawn. And I thought it was really interesting because at the beginning, um, the patients were all given a picture of the doctor they were going to have. So they knew if it was a black doctor or a white doctor, and then they were asked to select the services they would take that day. And there was no difference um, at that point in the study. So it wasn't just people saying, oh, oh, it's a white doctor, right? Um, and then they, uh, they were asked to measure the doctor's qualifications. And again, there was no difference between thinking that the black doctors and the white doctors were all qualified. And then they went in and the um, black doctors were more able to convince and persuade the, um, this population of patients to accept more invasive and more expensive treatment. And then at the end, they were asked to rate their experience. And again, it was uniform. The patients didn't notice a difference for themselves in their individual experience. They're like, yeah, it was good. Hmm. But overall, the black doctors had been able to persuade the patients to do more. And in the end, they noticed that the black doctors had taken more notes than the white doctors. Interesting. Interesting. I'd, I'd like to chime in really quick with an interesting tidbit talking about having black doctors. And um, so my father, to put into context how recent it is that we have black doctors. My father was the first African-American admitted and graduated from UCLA's medical school. Hmm. So fairly recently, this 
you know, this last century. And he practiced medicine for, he was an OBGYN. That's what he focused in. Um, he practiced medicine for 14 or so years. And then he went back to school. He went to law school so that he could support people in malpractice suits because he felt like in his profession as an OBGYN, as a black doctor, he saw so much malpractice that he went back to school so he could support those people. And so thinking about people not seeing the difference between a, a black doctor and maybe a white doctor or any other race, I think about my dad and how he, I don't, maybe other doctors have done this. I've never heard of one where they quit being a doctor so they can go support people because they're not getting the correct care. Um, I forgot how that tied in, but I know I wanted yeah. to say that. <laughs> No, that's good. Joe, I want to hear what you have to say, but I went the, um, so I heard today, just today, I was listening to a news report and, and there's a group, a new group, maybe some of you know about it called um, uh, the Institute for Anti-Racism in Medicine. I think I've got the name correct. It's a newly formed group. And one of the statistics they offered was that only 2%, 2% of all physicians in this country are African-American women, 2%. So one of the, what a glaring, um, I guess, statement, indictment is, we've got to have more folks like, you know, Angie's uh, father going to medical school, uh, black and, uh, I mean, men and women. But Joe, give us your thoughts. Yeah, one of the um, social uh, factors is lack of health insurance. And, mm -hmm. um, and you can see it in states that have not expanded Medicaid. Those states have higher rates of, um, the higher disproportionate rates of, uh, of inequality um, among their black and brown and uh, indigenous peoples uh, population than they do among whites. Um, and you know that's my that's my beat. You know I cover health insurance, so um, so that I, that I think is a big problem. And the answer to that is to expand Medicaid in all uh, states. I think there are twelve states left that have not expanded their Medicaid programs. The eligibility rates uh, are low in in those states. Um, and and I wanted to mention that one other rich uh, rich one other um, uh, person of color who experienced um, a bad outcome uh, was uh, Chrissy Teigen, uh, who's married to uh, John Legend. Yeah. Um, and you know, you would think that's another one just like Serena and, uh, and Beyonce who has uh, all, the, um, uh, all the resources. A friend of, a friend of mine, um, uh, recently her mother died and her mother had been taken care of by a black woman, a Jamaican black woman. And uh, the, the, the Jamaican black woman, I don't know her name. I just heard this story secondhand, so I apologize, but uh, she had a stroke and they took her to the hospital. The White family, uh, friends of mine took her, they live here in East Ham. Um, <clears throat> they took her to the hospital and they were surprised because over the first two or three days of their uh, experience in the hospital, this was in a hospital in Connecticut, um, the, uh, she was treated, the, the uh, black Jamaican uh, woman who had taken care of their mother who died. Um, was treated very badly. And they were shocked because they were with her every step of the way, this white family, the white woman and white man. And um, they kept saying, she's fully insured. We pay for her health insurance. She has everything she needs. We're going to cover everything that she needs. And she was still treated badly. And it took them a number of days. I've heard this story secondhand, as I'm saying, but they were shocked. And I think that's part of the problem in America is we don't realize that this is happening unless it happens to us, but it doesn't happen to us. As a, as a white person, it doesn't happen to me, um, but, and as a, as a white family, it didn't happen to them. So, you know, when it does, I think it, it raises our awareness, but, you know, we have a big job to raise the awareness of those who aren't, uh, who don't know about it. You mentioned, Angie, that your dad uh, was a physician. Uh, he's probably um, uh, um, may know of the group. There's a group of medical doctors, the American, a, a group of Afri African American doctors um, have an association, not as big as the American Medical Association, but it is for black doctors. And, and I wonder if he was a member of that group. Um, he passed uh, several years ago, so I, I can't ask him, but I imagine that he would have been, he was very, very involved um, with the communities. 
So I don't know. I could I could try to look through his records. That'd be really interesting to find out. Yeah, National Medical Association, I think, is. Uh, oh, that sounds right. The organization you're you're referencing, uh, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say one more thing to, to to Gwyneth, and that was that you mentioned uh, how the different populations were affected in the different areas of the country. And um, USA Today did a great six-part series in October, I can send you the link, uh, mm -hmm. where they looked at um, six different populations. I believe it was six, maybe it was five, um, different populations and how they were affected by COVID. A black um, family, um, black families, um, Native American, Latino, um, I forget what the other two were, but uh, they did such a good job, very, very thorough reporting uh, to to uh, to bring this um, out, and that's just extraordinary work. Hmm. Uh, so I'll send you the link. Yeah, you know, I had a um, this discussion has reminded me of some experiences that I had and witnessed when I was working in in a hospital, and I was a chaplain. I've been a chaplain in uh, several hospitals, and uh, I remember now having to advocate for black patients that were admitted for any number of, of conditions and illnesses and, and what have you. And yeah, it, it was on more than one occasion when I had to go around, you know, with all the docs and they're reporting out, uh, you know, giving updates on their, their cases and all. And more than once I had to speak up in rounds when people were just passing over a, a patient of color and not offering the same sort of aggressive intervention that I knew they had offered to other patients who were white with this very same condition. And, and so I started speaking up. And of course, that didn't make me uh, very popular with, uh, with some of the docs in, in the room, but some of the, the case workers and social workers would come and say, well, I'm so glad you spoke up. And then I would say, why didn't you speak up? You know, you, why aren't you advocating? Why does it have to be the black guy in the room that's gonna speak up for the other black people and the right. brown people there? And I, there's one case, uh, I, we talked to somebody talked about pain management that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a black person comes in and is in severe pain uh, often, uh, and I think the mindset is, oh yeah, they're just they're trying to, they're they're foraging for drugs. They want they want drugs. You know, just that's all this is about. They really don't have the pain. And I again remember just starkly this, um, well, this very fit white young man came in, uh, drug overdose. I can't tell you they they moved heaven and hell to um, care for this young man who eventually died. He was only in his late twenties, uh, physically fit, handsome, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, a sort of stereotypical, right image. But man, you let a black person come in that's in the very same condition, and they just dismiss him. They won't, you know. It's like, well, you know, he brought it on himself, but she brought it on himself. Yeah. Go ahead, David. I see you. Now, I want to give you an example of that that I saw that was also extremely dramatic. It was at, I'm, I'm out of the school long enough now that I'm sure I can say this uh, without getting in any, they certainly aren't gonna fire me, uh, that one of our graduate students uh, in, I don't remember which department, but one of our basic science departments was studying for finals with a friend in our library when she developed a very severe pain in her neck. And all they had to do was walk down the hall into the emergency room, which they did. Took a long time to get seen. The resident who saw her uh, said that he thought that what she was doing was trying to get drugs. Hmm. He didn't know that she was one of our students. Uh, she called her father who drove from Philadelphia, took her down there to the hospital. Then she had torticollis, which is a severe spasm of the neck muscle. Um, but I thought, wow, in, you know, a graduate student in a medical student in your own emergency room mm -hmm. suffers from that. And I want to add to this one, one other study that uh, was just published in 2016, which looked at a large sample of medical students and residents and asked questions about African-American patients that would bear on treatment choices. And 
50 percent of these medical students and residents showed significant false beliefs about African-American patients that would make a difference in care. For example, that they feel less pain, which yeah. is a very common thing about African-Americans and goes back to slavery days. Uh, also that their skin is thicker, they're tougher uh, and tons of other things. But 50% of act, not just actively enrolled students, but residents are people who've graduated and are now in practice. So, well, when we said at the beginning, what are we going to do about this? We need everything that we've talked about, more African-American students. I will say Penn State's done a great job of recruiting African-American students. I had a lot of black students in my classes, but we really need to get the percentage of physicians, at least up to the percentage, percentage in our population. Mm -hmm. And we need to address I mean, these things like do African-Americans feel pain less intensely? It's not gonna be covered in a class ordinarily because it's not, I mean, people would say, why are you, who, who thinks that? There are all kinds of, of these beliefs and ideas about minorities in general and about women and about African-Americans that really need to be unpacked, discovered in studies like this, and then directly addressed and studies like this, it shouldn't just be studies, it should be screening. Mm. Mm. Because that's the source of a lot of the failed treatment that we're talking about. Yeah, I'm, I want to um, address uh, a couple of you now have mentioned um, observing the differences. And I've seen it a lot in my own family since um, I have so many black family members and, and had a couple of white family members um, and, and was there for the advanced care for um, my grandmothers. And, and I would see the differences. And I just wanna bring up a, a personal story for me about the pain, um, which leads into a, a, another thing about the ambiguity. Um, so in my chart, it would say I was biracial. So the doctors, the medical providers would know I was black. Um, and this, this racial construct of uh, this, this social construct of race goes a little bit beyond um, uh, just the color of your own skin, you know, so, so racists <laughs> categorize me as black. Um, and, but there's this ambiguity. I, I had a, a instance where they saw heart palpitations, they wanted to measure, they gave me an ultrasound. So there was gel and then they had to put a halter on overnight. So they had to get the gel off and prep my skin with an abrasive and then put the glue on for these leads. And I said something about how uncomfortable it was and they just, you know, brushed me off and it got worse. And I said, it's really itching and stinging. Is it supposed to do that? And they, they're like, yeah, don't worry about it. And then before I left, I said, this is really aggravating now. Is this okay? And she said, oh, we have a whiner. Yeah. At which point, I didn't say anything else, but overnight it got to the point where I couldn't sleep. It felt like there was a wool sweater on over a case of poison ivy. It was incredibly distressing and I could barely drive. I was so distracted. I got my Cerox there the next day and she went to take the leads off and she couldn't. She actually had to do a procedure to take them because it had actually eaten through my skin and I now had open wounds where, where all these leads were glued to me and she had to um, basically debrief the wounds. And she said, you should have said something. Wow. And I don't know if that was generic callous treatment. It probably wasn't gender-based since she was also a woman. It could have been racial, but it brings up another thing I wanted to mention, which is this ambiguity, which is part of racism and the experience of racism in America um, for minoritized people is, did that just happen to me because that person had a bad day or because I'm black or because, you know? And so when we talk about um, racism and, and healthcare, we need to talk about this weathering concept. I, I don't know if any of you have heard about um, the, uh, the idea that the, um, the cumulative impact of the racial, the racist experience, it impacts um, health and health outcome. 
And they, they actually did a study um, that showed that uh, younger black women were having better outcomes than even 25 year old black women and, and partly attributing this to the longer time in the racist society. And we talked, we talked already, right, about the, the immigrant women who had been here yeah. longer and, and their outcomes um, converging with the, uh, the population who, had, the native population. Um, so, so dad, you've talked about the weathering concept. Yes. Yeah, it's cumulative stress. And weathering is what it's called. It's a pretty decent term for it, actually. And there are a lot of things that it seems to account for. The part of part of what you can't come up with more concrete explanations of looks as though it must be related to stress. Uh, and more and more studies coming out these days are are supporting that hypothesis. Now, I mean, for heaven's sake, we know something about psychosomatic illness. We know something about the way in which stress produces ulcers and, and high blood pressure and so forth. We shouldn't be surprised. Can we call that, David and, and Gwyneth, can we call it trauma? Because that's one of the factors that leads to, and I don't know if we mentioned trauma, but uh, trauma in the Black community, in the Native American community, and in the Hispanic community um, from racism is high. And it becomes a factor that you live with every day. You know, uh, Black uh, people get pulled over by the police. Well, you know, that's just because they were driving while Black or walking while Black or yeah. uh, you name it. Um, so that's a factor that, that uh, needs to be included. I've never heard the term weathering, um, but it certainly is um, uh, related to trauma, I think. Now that's a new term for me as well. I, I thank you for that education. And Gwyneth, I gotta say, I'm so sorry you experienced that. I mean, just as a human being, I'm just, just I'm, yeah, I'm just sorry you didn't do that kind of that kind of suffering and uh, pain. So I, I want to move in, uh, and Anja, if you're okay, I, we have a second question that we asked our uh, uh, our guests who were on the street. Uh, uh, to respond to, and it's we've already alluded to it, and that's you know, so. What do we do? You know, how do we how do we change this? What do we do to correct this situation? So, why don't we take a moment and uh, hear what uh, Marie had to say about that and Paul? All right, and we'll be right back. I think it's incumbent upon us to be um, educated, uh, well-versed, um, you know, people of color, black people in particular, because I can only speak for them. So certainly having a, a broader education um, or I guess retraining about how you deliver as a physician, right? Because it's both structurally within uh, how, um, how you have healthcare organizations actually distributed, how their, their care, how the facilities are distributed structurally, uh, making sure that you are not depriving people of, um, of healthcare just because they're not located nearby. Now, clearly, if you, you can't just simply pick up a hospital and move it uh, 10 miles to make it more, uh, you know, make it achievable for people who've been denied healthcare to be, have it more easily, but maybe there are you know, shuttle systems you end up running instead. But I mean, this means that we need to acknowledge that this is actually a problem and that we need to uh, do something about it. You know, that it just does not, uh, you know, this is not right. You know, it's not right ethically, not right morally, not right um, in, on so many levels. So something like making uh, the services more easily available. So I think, um back to your point, that's the way we're gonna solve it is that we educate ourselves, arm ourselves with information and we're proactive and we um, use our voice and use it collectively. And I think there's no better time than now because the spotlight is on the disparity. You know, the spotlight is on the disparity. Um, the other part, you know, the other answer I know uh, that has been promoted is a single payer system which is certainly a, another way of doing that. So you just make sure that 
uh, nobody gets left behind because your particular, um, like your employer uh, is only has certain plans available. So if you just have plans that are available no matter where you are, which is the way that most of the world does it, then uh, that's another way you can just make sure that uh, at least you have a, a, a better chance, I think, of reducing health disparities in, in this, uh, in, in delivering the health care, making it available. It, you know, it's up to us to advocate for ourselves um, when we feel that um, we're not getting the proper care or we're not being listened to. So we've heard from Paul and from Marie, their thoughts on how do we address these disparities in healthcare when it comes to race? And one thing that really stuck out to me that Marie said that we mentioned earlier was advocating for ourselves. And we know that sometimes that works. And in Gwyneth's case, we know that sometimes that doesn't work. So uh, what are y'all's thoughts on how do we deal with these disparities and how do we deal with them either individually or how do we deal with the system that creates them? I'll open that up. I thought, um, I, I like, I, we, we talked about racism as a system and talking about how it, it has many subsystems that are all related. Um, because if you if you look at um, majority black neighborhoods bearing the higher burden of pollution and environmental risk, um, more hospital closures, scarcity of higher paying jobs, lack of quality education, lack of safe spaces to exercise and be physically active, um, lack of access to healthy food, over incarceration, which as I mentioned affects not only the inmates but also the health of the inmates' families. Um, we have to address all of it, but some really discrete things that have been shown to have an impact, aside from the longer term goal of having an increase in diversity in doctors, is also having an increase in lay health advisors that's been shown to work. So they have community members who are like well-liked and well-trusted do an 80 hour um, training and start having interventions in their own communities. That's been shown to work. Having more um, black doulas, which again, takes less time than training a doctor. And, and it should be noted that immigrant women and black women dominated the practice of midwifery in the US until the early 20th century. And the medicalization of the practice and the onslaught of, of regulations and licensures and stuff erected barriers to midwifery that started excluding women of color from, from that space. Um, so those are some of the things. We could end racism and have more, <laughs> more black doctors, more black doulas, more black lay health advocates. All right, so step one, end racism, got it. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it, we're working on it. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, Joe, I, 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 I have a suggestion. I think, <laughs> that it would, I think it would be really helpful if we recognize that all of the factors that Gwyneth listed, uh, economics, employment, uh, neighborhood, the, the state of neighborhoods, all of those things, all of those are associated <coughs> with medical problems. Uh, and not in, not just individually. They're all really, if you if you if you took obesity, for example, as a well-known health risk, seventy percent of American health expenses are related to obesity and the relationship of obesity as a cause of illness. Well, every one of the factors that we talked about that I just listed has plays a role in obesity. Neighborhoods, red line type neighborhoods poor neighborhoods, not only have a lack of space and places for exercise, but are dangerous to go out and take walks in and run in. So people don't go out and do that. Lack of education. Education is strongly correlated with better health because we use real estate taxes to fund our public school system. Poor people have poor schools and rich people have terrific schools. So, um, and, and what are some of the other factors that Quinn has mentioned? All of them, it's important to know, they are not separate. Employment is another one. 
Well, employment has something to do with neighborhood. Neighborhood has something to do with transportation, which then becomes an impediment to employment if you're in the wrong neighborhood, which means that's an impediment to getting out of poverty. So all of these, when we, when we think about how to make health better for African-Americans, it doesn't all simply work in the medical system. I mean, obviously that's what we've been mostly talking about and that's terrifically important. But even if we had a highly enlightened, open-minded, sympathetic medical system, if we didn't fix these other things, we would continue to have terrific you know, impact, negative impact on health. So I think it, it requires a holistic response, mm. which means that those people who say, what do you mean systemic racism? Yeah. Can't be, it's just a few bad people. Yeah. Well, that doesn't work. Oh, I wanna point out one more thing, which might set Joe up really nicely because he said it's your beat. But another thing is, providing good health insurance across the board to everyone with universal standards of care. And we talked earlier about Medicaid. One of the problems for many women of color and black women specifically in the um, maternal and infant outcomes is the gap in um, Medicaid uh, providing only 60 days postpartum treatment whereas a lot of these things come up during the rest of that first year after um, the birth. So, yeah, what do you think, Joe? Um, I think you're absolutely right about that, Gwyneth. And I think that um, uh, when you look at health insurance, um, and I think it was you who mentioned screening uh, a few minutes ago, uh, screening is very, very important. Um, Chad, uh, Chadwick Bozeman, the actor who died of um, colon cancer um, was only, what, 35 or 40? Yeah, so he was a young so man who had colon cancer. Yeah. And someone said, uh, I read somewhere that really that's a factor that should, um, uh, at me black men of his age should be screened before white men um, because the, uh, the disease, colon cancer, affects black men earlier in life than it does uh, white people. So, um, <clears throat> Um, but but health but health insurance is a is a very big um, factor and you know Americans have this idea that uh, you know we're we're rugged individualists and everything but that doesn't that, that you know, that doesn't serve us well that idea uh, when it comes to uh, to getting care in Europe um, you can get uh, very good care uh, for no cost and Americans don't even realize that you know we we think we have this great wonderful healthcare system well yeah. Um, maybe we do, but um, the financing of it is very poor and does not serve everyone. Um, so, so that would be uh, what I would suggest. Uh, it's a it's a hard thing to say. We've got to change the political system, but but basically uh, we do. Well, that's what uh, what Paul said uh, in on the video that we just saw. You know that we need a single payer system, mm -hmm. and you, you have a single payer system, then it just automatically takes away all the issues about, you know, what's that first question you get when you get to the emergency department? Do you have insurance? <laughs> you know, and I, they, they want to be seen or not. <laughs> Say again? I think if you have insurance, you're probably going to be seen quicker than somebody who doesn't. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's, that's the system, right? Um, so we could do away with that if everybody that walks in is going to get the same treatment, at least going to have their bills paid for, uh, the same way, uh, and it would just reduce some of the uh, the stratification and uh, oh, I, I'm look, try, looking for the word uh, that inefficiencies and equity. Equity, that's the word. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, David, absolutely. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I, I I lived for four years in Canada many years ago, uh, teaching there, and. Canada has universal health care, free universal health care. And my, my youngest child at the time was in the hospital for most of his first year after he was born. And we were in far Eastern Canada. He had to be flown to Toronto to Sick Children's Hospital. He had to spend six weeks there. I put the card, I handed the card to the person at the desk when he was first admitted to the hospital. I got it back. That's all I ever heard about what it cost. And that sounds to a lot of Americans apparently like an extravagant practice. Mm -hmm. 
it is a lot cheaper on the overall cost of care in the country than this ridiculous system that we're using. It's not just more fair, it's more efficient. Well, speaking of fair and efficient, um, I think we, we want to talk a little bit about this vaccine that's coming out for... Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead, Rev, take that over. No, well, I yeah, thanks, Angie. Uh, in the time we have remaining, I'd like us to spend some time on that because we are all hearing the reports, the statistics about out there. First of all, we've done a lot of anecdotal sharing, like I might say this evening and this during this time together, which is fine. But there's a whole ton of research, statistical work out there to support um, what's been shared here uh, during this conversation. Uh, so one of the things we're hearing is that uh, black folks, brown folks are dying at three times the rate of, of white folks from COVID-19. Uh, they are sicker uh, than the average white person is. And now we have these vaccines. Hallelujah. Grateful for that. I, I give thanks to the scientists and researchers and logistics personnel and pharmacists and nurses and doctors and UPS FedEx drivers, I, I give thanks to, to them all, right? Uh, but there's this hesitancy that's been proven statistically that black folks, a lot of black folks don't want to get it. Uh, they've got this uh, hesitancy about it. And uh, I think it probably comes down to trust. So let's, let's hear what our uh, panelists have to say or what you, Angie, have to say about, about that. I tossed something in on it. Uh, I, I think that we really need to make sure that we include reference to the Tuskegee experiment. That cannot be overestimated. And I speak to, I speak to African-American people every month who somehow in the conversation about health, that comes up as the reason that they will not do certain medical things. So if you didn't bring it up, I was going to bring it up. So I'm glad you brought, you brought it up. Absolutely right. Tuskegee. And I loved yeah, yeah I love that Michael Harriet brought it up this week because he was on a show on Sunday where he and then he posted on Twitter. Did you all see him just say to me that the Tuskegee experiment was so long ago? For uh, your information, that man was 15 when it ended. Mm, yeah. It wasn't so long ago. Oh. That was during my lifetime that it ended. Yeah, right. Yeah, it started in 1932, I believe, and it really didn't end until. Uh, 72. 70, 70, 72, yes, right. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I realized it was that recent. I will say oh, I yeah. started I started to read medical apartheid before this show uh, in preparation and I could I couldn't get through the first chapter. I, I needed to give myself a mental break with everything going on. Uh, mm -hmm. so I feel I feel somewhat ignorant on that on that note, but I think that really puts it into perspective mm -hmm. how like how far we have not come if that was, that was less than 40 years ago. Yeah, and, and it really is important to say, it's not just the Tuskegee experiment, it is the light that showed on the problem of trust between physicians and patients. And the um, informed consent movement was really triggered by the Tuskegee experiment. And we are not there yet. It, it, the really, we need to make it so that medical experts, when they talk about this stuff, they tell you the bad news with the good news. They tell you the whole thing and that and it's checkable because the tendency of the experts to try to move you into the treatment path that they would like by holding back on the risks and pushing on what they see as the benefits is very counterproductive, particularly to people like the African-American population who all, all they have to do is say, well, look at what you did before. I've got family, most of my family is in Baltimore, my black family, and I've got aunties who will just in the course of a conversation and they're not, they're not in the medical profession or anything, but Henrietta Locks will come up, right? Mm -hmm. they, they'll just, they'll be talking, that wasn't right. And they'll, they'll talk, there's a huge trust gap. It is part of, um, I don't know if I would call it the oral history, but it's part of the current conversation yeah. of, um, of our adults today. This is not a long time ago. And it's a well-founded lack of trust 
We shouldn't say they That's just need right. to understand better. No, the people who are not trusted need to understand better. There's a reason for the lack of trust. Yes, right? There are right. reasons for the lack of trust. And I, it no, be addressed. Yeah. Uh, I'm chopping it a bit to say more, but I'm I'm, I'm supposed to be co-hosting, so I'm gonna. <laughs> Joe, come on, get in here. Yeah, I interviewed a woman uh, in Baltimore, actually, Gwyneth, um, recently, and she was working for Johns Hopkins as um, a, a person whose job was to uh, test um, populations, um, uh, test patients in uh, areas where they might be reluctant to, to get tested. And uh, she had a, um, a really tough job because she was working with a lot of Latino communities and um, they you know, didn't wanna be tested because uh, they thought they had to pay. They didn't wanna be tested because they thought if they tested positive, they would not be able to work. They didn't want to be tested because um, uh, you, they would be identified as someone who, uh, you know, uh, shouldn't. Um, uh, uh, there were a lot of reasons why they didn't want to be tested. Those are those are a couple of a couple of the big ones. And if they're reluctant to be tested, um, then and they don't get tested, and then and they're they're um, infected, then that continues to spread the um, the virus. And uh, that was a very hard uh, barrier for her to break break through, but you know, that was her job and she was very, very good at it. Um, but it was great to hear her talk. Um, but, uh, but that's just one part of the problem, which was uh, testing and vaccines is a whole nother part of the problem. I th oh, I think the other was reluctance was, you know, just don't trust the healthcare system because as soon as you're identified in the healthcare system, well, then you have a problem and they didn't want that. So um, yeah, we have, we have a lot of work to do to, to overcome those barriers. So let me ask the, the, um, the scientists here, I heard something uh, from a very reputable source um, a couple of weeks ago about the polio vaccine that I had not heard before. That, you know, there were two ways of administering that vaccine. Uh, one was with the injection into the arm, but also there was the sugar cube and the uh, vaccine was placed on the top of a sugar cube. And if I've got this correct, um, the white folks got the injection in the arm mm. and the people of color got the sugar cube. I may have that reversed, but I think that's what I would do. Any of you have any knowledge about that? I've never, I've never heard of that. But when you said the white people got the shot, I, my first immediate thought was they didn't put the vaccine on the sugar cube when they gave it to the black people. That was my. I don't know. I have no idea if that's true. I have no idea what you talk about, Rev. But I'm just gonna say, based on my experience, yes. that's what I think happened. I have no idea either, Bill. But there is something about the polio vaccine that has also played into the lack of trust. At the beginning of the polio vaccine, we had to use live. Uh, polio mm. virus. Yeah. And eventually, I mean, and that had risks, and people did get polio from the vaccine. Mm. And mm. as they moved toward a safer vaccine, doctors started telling big fibs about, about risk and what was what the vaccine was actually like now during that transition period. I don't remember all the details, but I know that I, at the time I thought this is another one of those examples where that you're going to regret hmm. because you really need to say what the risks are, admit to them and identify them when they emerge. Because I'm sure that that's, I've heard people use the polio vaccine in a variety of ways as examples, probably coming from that historically. I wouldn't be surprised if the sugar cube thing may be something to do with what the, how the vaccine was administered in the 50s, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. Uh, there was a report last night on the Rachel Maddow show. She talked about it, Will. Um, ah. I think she said that, if I recall this correctly, the Sabin vaccine was administered orally and the Salk vaccine was, um, was, a, was uh, an inoculation in the arm. Ah. Um, now, I don't recall her saying uh, any more about that than just that, but um, I might have missed it. Yeah, but, yeah. Know, okay. It bears looking into. Yeah, I'm going to do some homework on that myself, yeah. So um, we're at our time, folks. I can't believe it. This is uh, uh, phenomenal. First of all, uh, our audience should know that uh, 
Gwyneth uh, Packard and uh, David Huppert are related. Uh, you heard them refer to one another as, uh, as, as uh, well, she referred to him as dad a few times. So that's the connection there. We go way back. <laughs> yeah, we go way back. Right? <laughs> you know one another. You know one another from the beginning. From the beginning, yeah. So I want to thank you, uh, you both, for uh, uh, contributing to uh, the conversation around these disparities in healthcare, medicine, and the challenges uh, that we face to eradicating it. The the racism that exists there. And Joe Burns, uh, thank you for the work that you are doing. Um, keep up the uh, the good work in spreading the word. Uh, through your your writings, uh, very, very much appreciate it. Uh, Anja, always a, a pleasure to be with you and uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> so, uh, folks, we, we thank you for tuning in to the conversation, a chance for us to some, have some honest dialogue around issues of race and racism. We're grateful that you tune in. Thanks as always to uh, Deborah Rogers and Alan Russell uh, from FCTV for this opportunity and all the behind the scenes work they do in pulling this all together and, and making me look good or as best as they can uh, given what they've got to work with, all right? So until we're together again for uh, the conversation, uh, be safe. I heard something recently, what did it say? So uh, stay positive. Test negative. Ooh. Bye for now. <laughs>